with regard to that's shocking uh, news about Boston and staying in Boston now. That, Just want to like give you guys like what's happening at GW and why I don't think GW can handle this situation. Hello, it's Yutong here. Today I will be doing a reaction video of Dr. Fauci virtual event hosted by GW. This is exciting because since the pandemic has started, Dr. Fauci is the guy that caught everyone's attention. And obviously, I like his personality. He's a very honest guy. And without further ado, let's get into the video. Dr. Fauci, thank you for your time and welcome. It's great to see you. Thank you, Frank. It's good to be with you again. Well, let me Fauci first too. off start by, uh -huh. by saying thank you for your time again. And um, how are you doing in the middle of all this? This is insanity. Yeah, uh, you're right. It's, it's really somewhat surreal. Uh, I'm fine, Frank. It's just uh, very intense. Uh, I mean, obviously, we're working 16, 17 hours a day on this and I mean, it's seven, seven days a week. But it's something we have to do, Frank. This is a challenge, as you well know. Well, there's a lot we have to discuss here, um, but I do want to dive right in. I saw a story the other day, Dr. Fauci. Um, it was about Boston, about this other pandemic you just referenced. Um, different time, different science, but the headline haunted me. The headline said, Boston refused to close schools during the 1918 flu, then children began to die. Is history about to repeat itself as we head to the school season? I think there's a difference there, Frank. I think that if you look at the situation um, with regard to That's shocking uh, news about Boston. the current pandemic, in Boston is that children clearly uh, have much less of a chance having a serious outcome when you look at hospitalization rates per 100,000. However, we should not neglect the fact that children, some, can get seriously ill, much lesser, lesser likelihood than the adults. But the issue is we're starting to learn a lot about children getting infected. They clearly do. And there have been some studies to show that children from 10 to 19 can transmit to adults as easily as adults transmit to adults. So some schools are opening, right. some schools are not, some right. schools are going hybrid, uh, but it's a patchwork. And right. it's left to local decision makers, some of whom may have direct public health and medical guidance, the latest science, and some not. Aren't you concerned about the way this is being done? And not only that, yeah, of course. children, but the children as transmitters of this. Well, that's the, that's the point I was trying to make when I was talking about the chances of a child transmitting it to an adult. And even very young children have a high degree of virus when you look at virus titers in their nasopharynx. So they certainly are capable of transmitting. The degree to which they do, I think, is going to learn a lot about in the coming weeks and months. Sure. But, Part of the schooling discussion, of course, extends to colleges and universities. Well, this one, George Washington University, fully intended to bring people back in a hybrid and careful way and then had to change that yeah. uh, posture. And it's now going to be virtual. Unfortunately, today, as we speak, uh, Michigan State University said it's going to go virtual um, for the semester. Notre Dame says it's going to do it for two weeks, bring people back. But if there are clusters and it can't do it, it won't. UNC had to had to flip on this. Dr. Fauci, as you are seeing schools grapple with this decision and try to reconvene across the country, what's reasonable? Is there any way to bring students back from all parts of the country, have them gather in dorms, in classrooms, in hallways, deal with the reality of campus life, and be able to safely reopen? I just want to like briefly mention about my school is that my school basically canceled the in-person lecture and just everything three to four days like prior to the moving. And it's crazy that I don't think anyone expected. So that kind of sucks. I was like hoping to get back to campus and just like study with other people. But now I, I have to stay here in Boston and kind of sucks. But that's how it is now. Right. So we want to make sure now that the viewers know that we're no longer talking about elementary, middle school. We're, we're talking, talking about, about college and university. university. It's a big, big difference. It's right? called fraternities and parties and other <laughs> yeah. things, too. <laughs> you know, it's a big difference because you are bringing, and, and that sort of really cannot address the concern I have about what the level of infection is in the particular place you're coming because people are coming from all over the country. You right. may be having people coming from red zones, yellow zones, and green zones. 
It really varies. There are some universities and colleges that have a system set up where they test virtually everybody that comes in before they even get there to make sure you don't introduce into the community of dorms and in the college infected individuals and then screen individuals and have situations if you have the facilities and the resources to do it where you might have an empty dorm where when someone tests positive you can safely isolate them there and if they need medical care you can get them the medical care if you have the capability of doing that it is conceivable that you may be able to successfully bring people back to colleges and universities. It's conceivable, but is it feasible? Yeah, I think so in, some, yeah, in some cases it might be. But uh, it sounds to me like you're saying in most cases you're skeptical of this. I, I, I can't say most. You've got to go university by university. Just want to like give you guys like what's happening at GW and why I don't think GW can handle this situation and why we have to move to online. Like what Dr. Fauci said, like, and also just like um, Mr. Senseno, I hope I didn't pronounce his name wrong. But anyway, um, GW has like many dorms. One of the freshman dorm is like renovating at this moment. I think they also figure out other like alternative dorms and just put people in, but they didn't expect the pandemic. So they have been like preparing, like keep six feet apart from one bed to another bed, even though I think it won't really be effective if one person in your dorm get the disease, even though your bed is like six feet away from him, it's not gonna really be that effective. Dorm room is tiny, you know, just. What more, what new do we know about the effects of this disease among those who have had it at a fairly serious level in terms of persistent right. damage to their bodies. Yeah. The thing that worries me more is what we're seeing about the subtle, insidious effects on the cardiovascular system and the nervous system, namely MRIs and PET scans that show abnormalities of inflammatory processes in the brain and in the heart of some individuals. And it isn't like... 1% or 2%, if you look at it, it's individuals where it could even be double digit percent where you see this. Now, they may be reversible and they may completely clear after a while, but we don't know that. It seems we to need me to that follow that. that. Right. Yeah, it's it seems to me that that is a vital part of the messaging um, and it's not often not getting out. It's about dying or not dying, opening or not opening, as opposed to how brutal this illness can That's be a good just point, to get it honestly. and the potential of long-lasting like effects effect in ways that we recovered. don't even know. So there's a, there are la layers of risk here. Vaccine. Vladimir Putin, Sputnik 5, he's got one. He says his daughter's gotten the vaccine. Bogus, <laughs> dangerous, or a Mother credible Russia. shot? What do you think? Well, the Russians, to my knowledge, and I'm pretty sure I'm correct, have not been studying this intensively in very large randomized placebo-controlled trials. Well, I'm sure Vladimir Putin will be happy to hear you say it's bogus that he's running around saying this. Well, I'm not want to be saying I'm calling him bogus. No, what I I'm saying, say I'm saying, that's not what I said. I'm saying... Mm -hmm. Just wanted to make a quick comment that, you know, <laughs> countries like Russia and they're just like, they have sort of like the state-owned media and oftentimes state-owned media, whenever they invented something, Obviously, state-owned media is lack of like criticism toward this vaccine and toward this like great news. Like inventing a vaccine, obviously, it's like a huge news and it's like huge success and people are happy. Obviously, they oftentimes miss out the criticism part, and I feel like that's important. What do you make of the great division, political division? Every poll shows this in yeah. this country, whether it's masks to actually believing whether this whole thing is somehow a hoax. What we're seeing now is intense divisiveness that transcends COVID-19. It's there even without COVID-19. And the perfect negative storm that really makes it very difficult and problematic when you're trying to deal with a public health challenge is that you have that divisiveness that makes the politicization of the response which we're seeing 
very, very difficult, where you have people who are on political different sides of whatever a particular issue is, but it gets thrown into the public health. So it's a statement, you know, masks, no masks, or this or not that. It shouldn't be that way. The public health challenge is a challenge for everybody. It doesn't make any difference what your political ideology is or what you feel strongly about one way or the other. We should be completely in line with each other that this is a serious public health problem. Have you tried saying that? Us all. Have you tried saying that to the president of the United States? I say tried that saying didn't... that to uh, uh, conservatives on the Hill who grilled you in your congressional testimony? Yeah. I mean, all you need to do is look at the record. See me <laughs> on, on, on my testimony. I say the same thing I'm telling you right now. I don't change what I say, Frank. We need to pull together. We are all in this together. Just want to pause here and talk about like the mask mask culture in the u.s like coming from asia like obviously there's like a mask culture and this culture is just like a lot of like i think it started because of like air pollution and then followed by a lot of like celebrities started to wear it like asian celebrities they wear it because they they don't want people to find out who they are and just like um making them run <laughs> But I mean, like, like when I was like in middle school, I started to wear like the N95, like the very high medical grade mask since then. And like I, I went to middle school in China, like I came to the US before high school and I had experienced that mask culture. It's not because of the virus, it's because of the air quality is kind of bad. Um, after I came to the America, things change a lot in terms of like how people view masks. They think of it as like only sick people wear it. And I remember I was like at the very early stage of like COVID-19 in the US, I was, I was on campus and I saw a lot of like international kids, especially like kids who are from Asia, they started to wear masks and I like having to ex to live in the U.S. for a couple of years, even though I had experienced that before, but I still don't see it as like I need it. And I know COVID-19 has started in the U.S. I don't know the scale of it. Like, I don't know how severe it is, but I know it's like growing. So I didn't wear it at first, but then after I read news from like Wuhan and also from a lot of like sources that show how serious the virus could be. I started to wear it and I think the turning point for me to wear the mask was happening right around like when the school announced, oh, everyone, you have to like, after the spring break, don't come back for two weeks, just stay there. And I heard that and I, I know that, oh, it's getting bad for sure. Otherwise, school wouldn't do this. So obviously, a lot of people blame China for this, but I, I feel like that just like a politics thing. Like, what's more important for the public to talk about and to discuss about, and for the governments are just are not blaming each other for like, oh, it's your fault, it's your fault. I mean, government they like Dr. Fauci has said that like this is not man-made virus. This is totally just like from the nature and etc. And I think if you put this to a different country, it will also happen the same way, you know. So we as humans should be united and just fight the virus together. Dr. Fauci, I know you've got to run. I want to thank you for your time, for your generosity of spirit, for your incredible um, and intrepid <laughs> attitude as you uh, in encounter all of this stuff. Thank you very much, and we wish you, on behalf of George Washington University and all of us, uh, the very best of luck and very speedy results in all the work that you're doing on behalf yeah. of the rest of us. <laughs> Thank you, Frank. As always, over many years with you, it's always good to be with you. Thanks a lot. Uh, I, I look forward to doing it again. I'm sorry we didn't get to the other 132 questions <laughs> that we got, but perhaps we'll have an encore performance, and I thank all the students and faculty and others who sent those questions, and thanks again to you. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you. I'm not the girl that I used to be sometimes. I'm more than worse. I'm here what I once was.